Hello and welcome to the second episode of Tale of Four Gamers. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody who's watched the first one. It racks up over a thousand views in the first uh, like two weeks, which for me that's pretty that's quite good. I mean, on the scale of some other YouTubers like Mr. Beast, maybe not so much. But thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the ongoing series. Um, as you may see, I am in the process of painting um, month two at the moment. And uh, month one is done for me. I know, Mike, I think you finished month one in like the first week or something. I mean, you'd mostly finished by the time we recorded episode one. I, yeah, I finished month one by when we recorded month one and then finished <laughs> month two not long after and had to try very hard not to keep painting Skaven. <laughs> You're basically plotting other armies because you've already finished painting stuff for this month. You you, you say plotting, I say painting. Um <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I'll try. I'll fling some photos over to you for uh, other stuff I painted this month, and you can flash them all up. Uh, okay. And then, yeah, because I seem to paint a lot. I didn't realize quite how much. Well, you've flashed over some photos, which I'll, I'll throw up on the video here. But so you've already got yet more Skaven slaves. Is that Skaven slaves in the? So I painted uh so i got uh, so i got my skaven slaves done so there's two units of 10 skaven slaves one with shields there's two units of 20 clan rats uh with commands although i've forgotten to paint the banners so i'll get around to that and then there's a bigger unit of clan rats with the screaming bell which was my month two so the screaming bell is your month two yes the Skaven Slaves and the Clan Rats are the stuff you painted in month one, then? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and not just more Skaven. Because I know you do have like Clan Rats coming out of your ears. I, I, I might have some more waiting for Undercoat. Because what, what, what goes better with Clan Rats than more Clan Rats? <laughs> um, so yeah, month one was 80 Clan Rats. And the Command. But month two no. was a Screaming Bell to have slight model parity. Um, there, are, the there are people who... In their in, who have probably been in the hobby for twenty years, who have left, painted less than eighty models in their entire <laughs> hobby <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of armies that are less than eighty models, but, but yeah, I've got 80, and, and yeah, I am planning another uh, twelve clan rats or something. So I'm going to probably run them up to two units of twenty five and a unit of close to forty. And how did you find painting the Screaming Bell? A, a great change from painting 80 clan rats. Um, like, contrast paints are just amazing. Like, just spray it white. Like, all the wood was a coat of, uh, I'm going to completely mispronounce the name, Gargrax Sewer? Or... Gargrax Sewer? Oh, yeah, I mean, that, something like that. That, that dark brown contrast paint just does all the wood nice and easily. Like, it's. Yeah, um, I having having been somebody in the hobby for like twenty years, um, I've resolved myself to be an army level painter. Not, I'm never going to win a golden demon. So, I've learned tricks to make it easy to paint and get a decent finish. And contrast paints just basically took about fifteen years of that twenty years and threw it in the bin um, because like literally do base color of whatever the contrast paint is find a color that matches the top end of it to mm -hmm. neaten up that a, a highlight above that job job done like all the metallics are just straight metallics with um null oil wash and i think it's turned out pretty good i think they look awesome um i've just popped you over a picture which hopefully you can see now, um, of how I'm getting on with my month two. So mine is the Knight's Errant that I said I was going to do, because I, I cunningly stole Murray's idea of doing a smaller amount for this month, so I can break my back next month <laughs> with my uh, three for two offer. Uh, but yeah, I uh, last night I threw some contrast paints on the horses for the, um, for the Knight's Errant. And to be honest, most of the time that was taken up with fiddling around with a roll of like a tiny roll of masking tape, masking off saltiers and lines and stuff to stop the to keep giving me nice crisp lines for the, the heraldry on them, and then it's just been a case of slap the contrast on, and I'm just going over now, um, layering up with the colours over the top. That contrast really does, for an army painting point of view, make a massive difference. 
Um, I, I painted most of a unit in the time that it took me to do part of Bertrand Le Brigand. Albeit I love Bertrand Le Brigand, he's a brilliant model to paint. Um, before we go to uh, Murray's studiously avoiding my eye line, let's go to Willard. Willard, how are you getting on? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. And um, so I've, I've been I've been distracted by things like Giant Box's boarding action drone and things like that. Yeah. But beyond that, like I've definitely got myself into a place where um, I am... My month one is all... I'm definitely behind everybody else, I think. My month one is all assembled and based and now is ready to ready to spray but it should be quite quick i think i've got a bunch of days off this weekend so i should be able to catch up and my month two has gone a bit it's gone differently from the way i planned so essentially mm -hmm. in, in a classically um in a classically sort of so I do quite like the sense that, uh, of this of like sort of re-experiencing what it's like to be a teenager while we're doing this, because that's the sort of period we're in. So I, um, uh, I had a conversation with my wife about how much money I might spend on this project. She was like, don't spend that amount of money on it. So I said, what I had to do was to find month two, I had to, I was very lucky in the sense that um, very generously, Michael sent me some beast men, which gave me some extra beast men, which is very nice. And then I was like, right, okay, so I've got a few more beast men, and then I had a look at my bi my bits boxes for things that would be like Warhammer appropriate to fit in that I wouldn't have to actually spend any money on. And I found a cool giant. So part of my month two is going to be a giant, which I learned that you can have in a Chaos Army. Mm. I had to read the books very carefully to learn you can have them in a Chaos Army, but. If you've got a beast man general in a chaos army, you can ally in orcs and goblins. And of course, giants live in the orcs and goblins, but boom, giant in the beast man army. Makes perfect sense. Giants and beast men, they definitely hang out. But that still left me some points spare. So I was like, what can I do? What can I do? And I got this huge pile of bits everywhere. And then I picked up one of the beast men that Michael sent me. And I was like, I've always thought these models were a bit weird because there's... They've got, they're very, like, beasty beast men with, like, hairy bellies, and they're only wearing loincloths. And, you know, there's not a lot, they've not got a lot of kit, but then they've got these very shiny halberds, like, very, like, beautifully sculpted halberds. And I've always thought that was a bit weird, because basically, like, the modern beast men models, everyone's armed with, like, a stick with a rocket, like, hammer into it. Like, no one's got anything high-tech. So those, those fifth edition beast men are a bit, like, they're a bit kind of fancy. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, does that, does that really fit my sort of vision of a beast man? And I tried to think, like, why would a beast man have a really funky halberd? And then it hit me, maybe as a beast man, you only get to, and also Bestigor own, or can only be equipped with halberds. Right, and I was like, maybe you can only become a bestigor and like prove your manhood. You've got to kill an imperial halberdier and take his halberd ah. to prove that you're a bestigor. And suddenly, like, it was one of those sort of like hobby moments where you're like, oh no, what have I unleashed in my <laughs> brain? So a plan's gone completely out the window, and I've now basically started converting really badass looking bestigor out of like chaos warrior and empire bits so they'll look really cool they won't be very good in the game there'll be about 10 of them in one well, bestigor you've got, you've got two wound model they're strength four to begin with and that's before they get the plus one strength from the halberd so you say they're not going to be very good they're probably actually I mean, they're strength, strength, hitting strength five toughness four with two wounds I and mean, they'll be pretty good but they are still probably going to get written, ridden down by your knights let's be honest they've had a lot of points to have heavy armor <laughs> Like, well, they got heavy armor and shields, can't they? So that's a four-up save. They yeah, think they've got shields, they no, and, and not with a halberd in combat. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, halberd's a two-handed weapon, yeah. But I think yeah. they still the models had the shields in one hand, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. It does have a shield, but it can't. It can only use it. Uh, I suppose. So power. still a five-up save in combat, but still yeah, five-up save in combat, which almost anyone who's a proper combat unit will ignore. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. They'll look really cool. You, you just need. Cool. You just need to bait Ben into charging your Ungor, who nobody cares about, mm. and then counter charge with your Bestigor, because knights aren't quite as nasty when they're not charging with lances. Well, funnily yeah. enough, I'm painting knights errant who get a little bit impetuous and charge things. You put whatever's closest to them, they're going to charge them. Mm. But yes, so I'm doing a so my month two is going to be a giant and then a small unit of Vestigor because you couldn't have a big unit of Vestigor because obviously only a very few, only the boldest and bravest of beastmen can be mighty Vestigor. So that's what I'm having for my month two. 
Which giant model are you get? Is it? Is it the classic Marauder giant, the big kind of hairy faced one, or is it? The... No, it's one of the beastmen. It's there was a weird period where the beastmen got a, like a giant model, but I never saw them on the table. And it's like a sort of a a yeah. So it, you can build it as like a Cygor or a. Is it Gorgon? Yeah, the one with yeah. four arms or the right, Cyclops yeah, yeah. one. So I'm basically building. I'm building that. As I think you never saw it on the tabletop. Well, because they just, the beastmen, well, basically, being boring to explain why I never saw one on the tabletop, essentially, it came out right at the end of 6th, just before 7th came out, there was a new Beastman book that was designed to work with 7th and with 6th, and it kind of didn't work with either, and no, they were rubbish in 6th and rubbish in 7th, and so basically the Cygor had a magic power that sort of messed with wizards in the way that they did in 6th, but it kind of didn't work very well in 7th, and then the... The other one, the Gorgon, was just a lot. I think it had lots of arms, but was too many points to really use. Um, the time I was remember just them like throwing rocks at my Skaven and loads of Skaven dying. Yeah, that, it, it is seven. That, that's just it's Skaven. seven. This is sick. It was seven. Yeah, no, no, no. It came, came out. out right at the end of six. It was just before seven. After before. that one. Yeah, after that one. Okay. It's the book that's got the Jabba Slide and the weird, oh, like, mega pig oh, in it. Oh, that so one. The Jabba Slide and the Razor... Razor Gore. Razor no, Gore. it's not a Razor Gore. It's called something... I can't remember. Is it, it Razor Gore? No, it was. I think a Razor Gore. It was a really, really awful model. The yeah. mega pig. It's like an it, yeah. ultimate pig. I, w- I was disappointed because it was an awful model, but rules-wise, it was great. And I'm like, yes. I'd, I'd quite like to make a beast of chaos army work at that point. You needed everything you could get hold of. So I was like, oh, I should get. And then I looked at them. I'm, like, I'm just, I'm just not fielding those. <laughs> I just refuse. So I'll make my own. Really bad. But, but the key, the key thing that really annoyed me about it was effectively the thing I loved about the sixth edition beastman army, which I have sort of recreated in the in fifth by like jiggling things around is I love the sense of like that kind of, um, you know, the, the opening scene of gladiator where you've got like this sort of disciplined ranks of troops like, yeah. marching, and then you've just got this absolute horde of idiots charging out of the forest on fire. That's how every game against sixth edition beastmen felt where you'd like, you've got these, like they come in waves and they sort of surround you and it feels like terrible. And then they charge into your square and then, you remember that you've got discipline and training and they've just got big clubs and then you win and they run away, but then they rally and then the chariots is brilliant. But anyway, so suffice to say, I love that sort of running away, skirmishing, silliness kind of beastman army. Um, and, and, and I'm hopefully going to be able to create something approaching that um, in fifth. So well, have you played with your beastman? You, you get the idea that the enemy are charging in nice discipline ranks with Zimmerman's only ever yeah. uh, Pete, a score that he does <laughs> and just recreates it for every film playing in the background and all of your guys shouting Zulu because if you listen to them they're all shouting Zulu um, <laughs> I thought they were really, shouting really like, like Hoon or something it, is, it sounds very much like the beginning of you, know, the you listen to it and you're like that sounds very much like you're all just chanting Zulu like you've just watched the film and you've gone <laughs> yep that's what Germans in, in, the, in BC sound like all I know is I was doing Dark Age reenactment at the time it came out, and <sighs> we, we saw it about five times back to back just because we wanted to watch that opening scene. Um, but then, when, next time I went to Hastings, pretty much all of like both sides were doing their utmost to pretend to be the guys from the German army from the beginning of that film. <laughs> just like a few years later when Three Hundred came out, everybody suddenly wanted to be a Spartan. I mean, I, I I still sort of do. I just don't have the body to pull off those, <laughs> those red robes, to be honest with you. But there you go. So that's my my month two is uh, is 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 budget driven. I'm going to do a giant from my pile of shame, and I'm also there's like a box of chaos, there's like a half box of chaos warriors that I like use the heads and arms for for something else, and now I'm turning them into Bestigore, and they look really cool. They look great. They're awesome models. Those chaos warriors, the ones with the big furry cloaks. <laughs> um, Murray. Yes. How is how is your painting coming then? Oh, fantastic! So um, I'm selling my house, and so um, most I know of the hobby is expensive, but still. <laughs> well, no, I'm selling my house, and hopefully getting a more expensive house. <laughs> but uh, the um, yeah, so uh, most of my painting has been walls um, and the like, and so hobby has taken a wee bit of a backseat. Um, I did get like a elves finished painted and based and everything which was yay 
Um, and I've technically been painting other wood elves, except these ones throw little balls about and um, try and not get smacked in the face by dwarves, um, which never happens because dwarves are blood bowl. Because um, I've got a blood bowl tournament I'm going to in a couple of weeks. But um, I am now frantically playing catch up um, and I'm not painting elves as we speak, honest gov. Yeah, I, I've I, unlike Mike, um, I can I can try and do simple. Well, I say simple, like effective paint jobs that look good when you've got lots of you know just like yes, this all looks great because I can paint to like fantastic army standards. I can't. I don't know. I've never been able to, and I just get into detail and go oh highlights. I could do lots of highlights, and I start painting highlights, and I get sucked into highlights. <laughs> Just, how, how many layers of highlights did you do on your Blood Angels? Six? No, more. No. <laughs> like, okay, so the Blood Angels, you go with, uh, there's a there's red, uh, Mephist and red as a base, and then there's a corn glaze, and then, uh, yeah, there's a corn red glaze and um, recess shade, and then a corn red and incubi darkness glaze and recess shade, then a two to one corn incubi, and it carries on. And then it's the same going up with oranges. And then it gets, everything gets a flesh terrors red glaze to bring everything into one cohesive thing. And it looks very nice. Thank you, Darren Latham, for your stupid tutorial that made me do this. But, um, <laughs> yes. Um, but that's how I paint. And so I paint very slowly. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the most complicated painting process I've ever done. And I think I think my most complicated one is maybe I've done one where I was like base coat highlight of doing a highlight. Now that is big for me, right? <laughs> highlight, base coat highlight, <laughs> then wash it. You know, base coat highlight, then shake, then washing, oil washing, and then weathering. And that's like that's a lot on one model. But yeah, that is nowhere near that. And and the other thing about that was that was like a centerpiece model that I really, 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 really liked. And I like did loads of it was um it was a it was a, a glaive for my heresy army. There was like a centerpiece model and it had like a really complicated kind of backstory to it as well, where I, I you know, I like really researched like what a so there's a bit in um the bit in the book uh, Mark of Calf where like all these super heavy tanks like fall out of orbit because basically like you know, things blow up in space and things fall out of orbit. And I was like, oh, really Gravity cool. happens. Gravity, Gravity happens. happens. Is a harsh mistress, as it turns out. But basically, um, I was like, God, wouldn't it be cool if you could, you know, somebody found the tanks and it had sort of mostly been intact when it got to the ground and they fixed it up. And so I, like, really researched, like, what heat burns look like coming out of orbit on, you know, metal things and stuff like that. And look, if I do say for myself, it looked really, really good. Um, but yeah, that was the most complicated painting process I've ever done, but that was like a mega centerpiece. But I do know people who do this, like much more complicated paint jobs on like individual troopers, shoulder pads. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So this, this is my paint job for just an intercessor. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think I'm, I then shot a lot with Chaos Knights, isn't it? Didn't yeah. And then, yeah. And then I just removed them turn one and two as a Chaos Knight. Goes, ha, 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 ha. What about yeah. Favourite sayings, um, there's a, a webcomic that used to be around called Schlock Mercenary, which had a bunch of maxims of maximally effective mercenaries. I've got one of them on a keychain, which is everything is airdroppable at least once. <laughs> <laughs> Similar maxims include everything is amphibious as long as you can get it out of the water again. I mean, it's not wrong. It's just but, the blood. Was it this? So uh, we've we've heard what um, Willard's fanciest paint job is. We've heard what Murray's uh, bog standard paint job is. Mike, fanciest paint job you've done? Um, yeah, that that that's. I'm I'm currently looking at my shelves to try and find anything that's more than a base coat, a wash, and then a tidy up, and maybe a highlight. That that's. That's that's a lie. I have been trying to push myself a bit more, not necessarily in the layers that I do, but in the complexity of the paint scheme. So something I painted reasonably recently, who hopefully will come into focus, is... Ooh, shiny Barahoff. Yeah, which involves rainbow wings <laughs> for match matching really the cool. codex. 
Um, so yeah, that was one of those ones where yeah, each individual wing is like a color, a wash, and then tidying up. But it's a full rainbow of like eight different colors. Um, and also doing things like um, custom banners. So oh, did you hang on, did you print that or did you paint it though? So I printed it and then painted over it. So oh, that's it, cool. it is yeah, that it counts. is painted. Um, so I've done him. I've done some e evil sons mech boys with banners Ooh, and things like that. So yeah, it's. I've been trying to push myself a bit to go away from just the, yeah, wash, tidy up. Oh, paint, wash, tidy up, and highlight. But with contrast paints, it's just one of those. It's a, it's so effective. Like mm. you you paint it like I've been using flesh terror as red, the light of the Skaven. Flesh terror as red, then tidy that up with Mephiston, red because that is pretty much the same color as the highlights come out of. The, the flesh terror is red contrast, and then evil sun scarlet. Yep. Just nice, simple, straightforward. Flesh terror is uh, red. Now with the uh, Mephisto red over the top, and the next thing will be the evil sun scarlet on it. Yeah, and it's wet, like because most of mine are, are designed like as I say, I'm an army painter. It's for looking good on a table when you're looking at it from two foot away. Like if it was going for a golden demon entry. By all means, I'd do what Murray does with six levels of highlights and shades and things. But would you know? Table, it, would you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I would try. I would mess it up royally. That's yeah. that's the other thing. I'm I'm clumsy, so I'm dyslexic. My hand-eye coordination isn't great, so I've learned ways of getting around mm. that problem. So, and it's why I've kind of just resolved myself to never being called demon painter. Because what I'd do is I would get it ninety percent done, and then accidentally paint a black line across its face. I just do the eyes. Yeah, and and that, it wouldn't even be. I'll just do the eyes. It'll be like, oh, I just need to highlight oh, his weapon. Um, um, I've sent you over a picture of probably the model that I have oh. spent the most on. Yes, he's very shiny, and he died horribly to my he chaos knight. He, he really amazing, did. Though. You did really let him have a chance to snip things. He got his own back. He went and attacked guard. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, one last thing I've probably spent the most time on ever was many years ago. Nikki got me for Christmas uh, Warmaster Horus for my heresy army, Sons of Horus, mm -hmm. and it was one of those ones of okay, I'm. At the time, didn't know they were going to be releasing another Horus model, but it was a, I'm never going to paint this model ever again, so I want to do the best possible job I can ever do on it. I think the the face was done with wafer-thin layers of very, very, very finely altered skin tone. Add a tiny bit more of the next layer up at the highlight to it, add some medium, paint a thin layer on, let it dry, add an extra bit of paint, add some medium, thin layer on let it dry the face took about two days but it was one of those okay it is going to be the centerpiece to the whole army so i can kind of understand Ooh. doing that for a you know a, a, a model that you've got a huge backstory to doing it mm. to line troops though <laughs> so wait a minute i did get one so talking about stupid amounts so the one model i spent most time is this this guy here oh that's your chapter master? Yeah, Samandriel, the Weeping Angel. Mm. But I used um, Louis. Um, what's an R? Sudgeon. 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 Her uh, face tutorial one. Louis Sudgeon. That is so nice. I, I mean, mean I, I, I'm the sort of person that just puts helmets on everyone. <laughs> Her paint videos are outstanding. They are. Like, absolutely outstanding. I must say that I'm mocking Murray for his painting on this, but you have produced some of the most beautiful Inquisitor models at Silent War. And have you won Best Inquisitor at any point? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're in, you know the um, the first the first one where uh, we're in Reading. And we yeah, the, had, the, when uh, we're in the drafty like sports. Yeah, hall. the drafty hall. Yeah. Um, like so hours. I got Vince to. Uh, sculpt me uh, a Maddox gun model, mm -hmm. um, which I have somewhere. Uh, I've got so, a picture of him I can throw up. That yeah, is, um, um, 
featured in one of the Silent War videos that I did. Yeah. So he was sculpted like from like Vince literally got like a, a made a um, uh, an armature and then sculpted sculpted him. Um, you some bits and bobs, but he's mostly hand sculpted. And then I went and picked him up the night before Silent War and painted him still as some of the green stuff was trying. And then just used him. And he won that he won best painted that year. I was like, no, no, you people don't know what <laughs> that's not right. And, and and you've not won since? No, I've not won since. <laughs> See, that, there's no, your problem. No, 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 no. Elizabeth Tabio, she um Did she, she win? Best, she yes, uh Bristol, she got best painted mm. okay. in Bristol. Right. Um, yeah, yeah before in last. Uh yeah, well the, the last one before lockdown. Yeah, yeah. the last one before oh, lockdown. Oh yeah. Um, that's the year before last close enough <laughs> silent war before the last yes yeah yeah just like three or four years ago oh surely we need to run them like every six months to catch up good question like it didn't did it run last year i can't remember it ran last year in october at warhammer world um i've got video of that which nikki filmed which i've got to edit and put up but i just haven't yet i'll try and do that this week maybe um but yeah that was um technically silent war six yeah, yeah. So that was that Silent War number six. It's just there was a two-year gap between five and six. Can I make a suggestion for Silent War seven? Because I think that one of the summers of um, 40K at the moment, and I think doing it in boarding action with just your retinue would be fucking cool. And just basically you have a 500 points and you've got to build your equipment and everything out of that. And then it's much more on It's a much smaller commitment. It's tempting. It is sorely thinking, tempting. Could, could, could we I'm do a huge delay? Could, could we do a Silent <laughs> War six and a half? Well, just a, just a boarding could action. Just, Silent just War. a boarding action, like maybe a one day boarding action meet up, and just that could be interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of events that I'm trying to do this year, there's obviously. The four of us are going to meet up at some point and do um, a mini Tale of Four Gamers tournament as they did it in the um, issue of White Dwarf 223. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also then going to be in June, hopefully, um, the Back to the Badlands, Return to the Badlands, uh, whatever I choose to call it, fifth edition campaign weekend, which I'm hoping to run for my 40th. And the plan is, if I can get them, 40 gamers for my 40th. I'm going to get in touch with Warhammer World and hopefully go, which weekend can I book 20 tables, please? <laughs> and get 40 gamers to turn up and we'll just... <laughs> we'll take over Warhammer World and run... Okay, this is an old this is an old world event now. This is, yeah, screw everything else. This is an old world territory now. We've got to put a flag up on everything. Um... <laughs> Sure, if I tasked Monk to do it, you could stick a flag up somewhere in Warhammer World that declares you know, prevalence of the old world. But maybe the day before, I mean, maybe we could do like a, a mini Silent War boarding action. It's It has happened before. When we did um, Sasha's speed, what the hell was it called? Death Race weekend, when we, some of us went up to Warhammer World and the one day was Sasha had written, Sasha's another guy from Hate, for those of you who don't know, does an amazing terrain. Um, he's got his own company putting together um, some boards and terrain. Uh, but he wrote essentially his own rules for uh, a racing. Was it just Sasha or was it Toby involved as well, Willard? Can you remember? It's Toby as well. Toby as yeah. well. He's so, so Sasha is like a kind of, um, if, you imagine, if you imagine Gandalf in a fez, <laughs> That's yes. pretty much what Sasha looks like, and he runs a he he runs a business selling terrain in between his real job of being like the CTO of various kind of global mega corporations, <laughs> um, and Toby is like a kind of um, could easily pass for like a monster in most monster movies, like well over six foot tall, covered in tattoos, covered in piercings, uh, climbed frankly, out of the like, pages of two thousand AD, I think. Movie. 100% like definitely you know haunting to look at sometimes but also like one of the loveliest people you'll ever meet in your entire yes. life like it's so charming and funny and clever and you know lovable in general terms but you know um looks like he would eat your heart <laughs> but yeah those two ran that and it was really good 
death race. Yeah, it was really cool. It was one of those moments. So something I weekend it was like a big hate thing where we all went up there. Um, it was I think it may have been for Sasha's birthday. But one of something I've always wanted to do, Warhammer wise, is I've always wanted to run. There's a, a Warhammer fantasy campaign, like a legendary role playing game campaign called the Enemy Within campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to. The the, the key. Th- problem with that campaign is effectively at some point in the campaign somebody will realize you could quit being adventurers and become wool merchants and you'll make loads more money which in the world world is really a much better idea rather than considering continuing to deal with horrors and as gm it's quite it's quite difficult to deal with that but but a solution to this is to give the players a ticking clock, at which point the world will literally end in a very sort of Majora's Mask, Legend of Zelda way. So I really like the idea that you would turn up on the Friday night and you've got until Bugman's closes on the Sunday to finish the whole thing. And if you don't finish the whole thing, by the end, the villain's plan succeeds and the Warhammer world is destroyed. And did that That's already happen? Yeah, it, well, I mean, <laughs> it's it's all right. That, it's, it, it's getting better and coming back. That does sound like an excellent yes. idea. And they've re-released the Enemy Within as part of Cubicle Seven's latest mm. edition of One Fancy Roleplay, haven't they? Yep, it, they have. They have. And you see people ro- if you go up to Bugman's Bar, like it's not just people playing in the. It's not just people playing in the um, in the gaming hall. You see people doing role playing games in the bar quite often. Like the bar seems pretty chill about it. So it's definitely something I was like, oh wow, that'd be amazing to do. But obviously, as as so often with so many plans, it's like, well, that would be amazing to do. And also, I have like, you know, a lovely wife what? and two children and a house, yeah. and a job, and all sorts of things like that. You know, so <laughs> it didn't happen, unfortunately. But yeah, it could, it in the could. future. Correct. Well, like you, like I said, they've re-released it. I keep meaning to pick up a copy of it because I've got the latest edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and it's brilliant. It's really well put together. Um, to almost, the point, pardon? it's almost exactly the same as Second. Yes, that's what I like about it. <laughs> oh, I <yeah>. love Second. <laughs> it's it's like they took Second and cleaned it up and made it look nicer. They could have cleaned up the gunpowder rules a bit more. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> me ultimately, grumbling about the embrace of pistols, my last character had. It's like, right, wait yeah. a minute. It's this page for this bit, and this page for this bit. This, but I just need to just wait a minute. I'm just going to cut these. Just out. do a crib there sheet. We go. <laughs> no, I had GG ultimately, the, the books, the books are very pretty, and I think there's a point at which you just have to kind of like leave aside. There's many times you have to do this in your career as a games workshop gamer. You just have to leave aside twenty or thirty years of game development you take it and you go that's nice but you're going to one side mm. i'm going back to 1989 now with some percentile dice <laughs> like you just have to kind of like live the dream don't worry about the fact that your highest stat is 35 and therefore two times out of three you will like fall down the stairs if your gm makes you roll for it you just gotta live it you just gotta I'll live the dream so that one you're bad at everything <laughs> So you talk about sort of games development um, and the way rule books are written. Um, playing other games outside of Games Workshop has made me appreciate how well GW rule books are mm. compared to other rule books. Like I've been, I've been playing a lot of um, sort of Team Yankee, and Team Yankee is mm. a very nice game. The rule book has got some really weird areas where some of the rules are, but it mostly is all right. But then. I, I love Team Yankee, by the way. I have a no, really, great I have a really big Team Yankee army. Do you have a? What is your Team Yankee army? So I've address? got Brits and Iranians. Uh, right, I've got, I've got American Marines. Ah, uh, Marines, all uh, Hueys, and I, I like to imagine that every. No, 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 no. Some Hueys and some in some in absolute death track Amtraks. Uh, so you know, when I finally play that game where somebody's got a river, I'm fucking, I'm fucking all over <laughs> You're it. on it. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I've even modelled my, um, I've even, I've even modelled my M1s as M1 um, HCs, which are the ones that are aquatic, <laughs> like you oh, know, <laughs> they can uh, swim if they have to. All my Brits are, in, all my Brits are painted in Berlin Brigade because I hate myself. Um, but uh, the, um, the how was it? That was it. But the Rules. One company, rules, but the one company whose 
rule uh, this game has got one of the best rule sets like the way the game plays is, um is star star wars armada Fan fantastic game like it's a really well thought out spaceship the mark spaceship game like big spaceship game fuck me they don't know how to put a rule book together like one rule book for the shooting phase is in seven different places in two books it's just like what why is what it's, it's almost like they these rules were afterthoughts and they went put it in the back of the book and it just carried on there was no thought and process of how they would build these booklets but once you've actually got around that brilliant game but no I'm trying to think right. what the worst late. I think I, I, that my brain got just broken by playing role playing games in the 1980s, and therefore, like anything that's better than anything that's better than like the Twilight 2000 box, which comes with like twenty paper thin booklets printed on like photocopied paper and like loosely stapled together, just like a pile of pile of paper that seems to bear no resemblance to each other, like. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to dig quite deep to have found, like, worse rule books. I actually find a lot of RPG rule books are really well laid out, I think, these days. Like, a lot, because I, I foolishly, I say, in, I'm going to use the term invest, and invest is the wrong word, because basically, I am, I'm exactly the sort of person that I quite often buy into RPG Kickstarters. And I love the idea of the setting. And then I, I never order more than the PDF. And then when it comes out, I very excitedly download it to my iPad and then don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but you've um, got it if you ever want to. That's right. I've got about, I've got more probably, unless my, my kind of, my mental calculation about it is I'm like, when I'm in an old people's home, I won't have much to do. And then I can get really into running role-playing games again. <laughs> That's the time, the key time. But, but you know, you'll be going back to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Second Edition. Yep. And no, oh, none, yeah, of, none of these other ones. <laughs> the only campaign I've played, I think, of Warhammer Fantasy Second Edition, you were saying about how like your highest stats 30, so you're failing yep. to. I built myself an actual reasonable duelist. Like, he could, he could fence, he could sword play, which, like, as well as any of them ever could. So he still misses half the time. But. We're sat there. It's like, okay, cool. We go. We go on an expedition, and we face river trolls. I'm just oh, like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> they, they, they climbed on our boat. I was I was down in my cabin at the time. I hear the whole boat lurches to one side as they start clambering up the side. I'm like, something's afoot. Let's go upstairs. Go upstairs with a glass of wine because why not? I was drinking in my cabin. Nothing else to do on the boat. Walk out, see two river trolls on the boat, the rest of the party about to lay into them, and just close the door and go back to my cabin. <laughs> what do you expect me to do? This is the game that you broke Nathan in the first session by out gambling his gamble character NPC. Uh, I was going to say, was this Nathan up to yeah. Yes, yes, it was. And, and, yeah, I, I proceeded to out bluff. A, a guy turned up when we were in a bar and he decided to pick a fight with me so he came kick, tried to kick the chair out from under me at which point I somehow passed the deck save to not fall on the floor grab the chair and sit back down on it at which point the guy looks at me you're sat in my chair which one bluff I think you'll find you're sat in my chair <laughs> to the guy that is stood next to me <laughs> which he just like I don't even know what to do now turns around and leaves <laughs> and then the npc's head exploded <laughs> yeah it was pretty much like it's like i tried to pick a fight with him what happened i don't know <laughs> i made him go home and question his reason for living <laughs> yeah <laughs> well look, the going back to willard's thing about and, and we have strayed quite well, some the point yes. somewhere over there out in the back my back garden it's fine um, I, I would a I would definitely be well up for for trying your idea of playing the enemy within <laughs> over the course of a weekend, like literally. Because if, if I presume, presume again, my lovely wife and child and, and life allow for such a thing to occur, it sounds like an awesome lot of fun. But also, you can, as Willard says, do role playing games in Bugmans because that weekend that we played Death Race, Sasha also ran. D and D in Bugmans, but it's okay because it was the edition of D and D that Games Workshop published. So it had Citadel's little logo on the bottom cover of the um, 
of the of the, of the rule book that he brought in. Uh, we we all yep. sat there at a corner booth in Bugman's with GW miniatures. Again, I think Sasha had set us the task of trying to find miniatures that were as old as the rule set he was playing, like 1982 or earlier. Um, <laughs> I had one of the original dwarf nine dwarf hero lord models that they'd done back then. But yeah, it's you can do role playing games in Bugman's, and it's a lot of fun. It's quite a chilled vent area just to sit and and play a game. It's good for it's good for for GW board games as well. Although my personal favourite GW board game is actually Fury of Dracula, which is have, have you ever played it? I haven't. It's been re released several times by by less GW companies, but the original game was a GW game through and through, and. Basically, all the re-releases have like kept the original genius of the, um, the, and it is a really genuinely good game. Where basically you've got sort of four people who play kind of like iconic vampire hunters from the Dracula novels, and one player plays Dracula, and essentially the vampire hunters individually cannot defeat Dracula and have to sort of find a way to do it, but they also have to find Dracula, and Dracula has to get like get around and get. You know, basically, Dracula has to sort of travel around Europe causing havoc. And if he causes enough havoc, then the world ends and the good players lose. But if, if they intercept him, then all sorts of shenanigans occur. But one of my favourite things is the key... This is possibly why I love the game so much. But the key way in which Dracula gets found by the random event cards is reporters from assorted British newspapers track him down. <laughs> what is, <laughs> what is this yet? European count doing? I just love the fact that basically Dracula in the GW war game has this massive tabloid press problem. <laughs> like, absolutely bonkers. Gosh, like, the paparazzi from the Daily Star. Yeah, absolutely. They're going through his bins being like, look, look at his coffin builds. It's outrageous. <laughs> Even in the fancy land, the Daily Telegraph are being utter, utter swines. <laughs> Dracula ate my hamster. <laughs> you cannot tell me that the I, I, I love the idea that Dracula is in fact defeated by the sun. <laughs> totally. He is <laughs> defeated by the sun. Ah! That's awesome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the uh, you cannot tell me that the Daily Telegraph would not be pro Dracula. <laughs> no, <laughs> they, they probably would be, wouldn't they? <laughs> if there was a less qualified vampire, then they would be in favour of him. <laughs> they definitely. Yeah, you know. Well, what I was going to say that... to go go back to was <laughs> the weekend that we did Death Race was also then the weekend where the second day, after we played Death Race the first day, everyone played random games. So, like, some people were playing Oi, That's My Leg in Bugman's. <laughs> and um, Trolls in the Pantry was played as well. But we also did a mini Silent War, because Silent War had happened about two weeks before it. And so we had about six of us who'd all been at Silent War, who brought our Silent War armies, and we played basically an epilogue, which was, okay, the bad guys had won um, the, the, the previous Silent War, Silent War, I think Silent War Five. And mm. as a result of that, um, the, the there was this space hulk that had a demon set loose on it. But to find out what happened to the demon, we played it out. The, th the six of us as a mini thing that could be quite a fun thing to do with boarding action. To be to do a mini Silent War one day thing before some other event, either before Fifth Edition weekend or just before something else that that happens up there. Uh, and spend a day playing through some, so like you say, some 500 point Silent War games where you've got your Inquisitor, your retinue, and whatever other bits and droogs from your armor you choose to throw in there with them. It's a really cool idea. It's a very, very cool idea. Maybe boost um, it up to I, 600 points so you can have 300 points of like bog stand stuff and then. I it. think I think you've just got to come. I personally think Silent War with 500 points to spend on your Inquisitor and his goons, and they'd be broken yeah. to the five man squads for yeah, bimbling yeah. around boarding action. But it, it just it, it, it would be the first time that it would be like the, the thing about I'd love Silent War, don't get me wrong, I and mean, this is no criticism of Silent War, but occasionally it does feel like very loud, clanky war. <laughs> <laughs> Secret mission going on here, and the, the tagline for Silent War Six was "This Silent War just got loud." Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so when like, when, like, when a, a Chaos Knights army turns up, yeah, like yeah. where it's all night, it's like this. This is definitely gone gone a bit loud. Yeah, there's a secret mission going on in the background of a tank company fighting a titan. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> where is the secret mission? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> in time yeah. depends how quarantined that planet is. If no Imperial citizens <laughs> know about it. <laughs> Even if they yeah, do, I mean, as long I've as you kill had... them all afterwards, it's still silent. Yeah. I've definitely had a great game at Silent War where there were two, basically two games going on, where there was my Rattlings desperately wrestling Matt Smith's kind of Indiana Jones themed guys over like some kind of magic cup or something as like a company of Imperial Fists and a, like a massive tank company that I brought with me just like shot the shot the crap out of each other but it was literally like playing two two wholly separate games <laughs> just that just happened to be on the same table which can be great fun well, I, th- I think that's what ended up with uh, pretty sure it was me and you Ben not uh, Silent War, like the Silent War Five, were down well, you, in Bristol. Yes, I I had Blood Ravens and uh, I, was, I, I had Infantry Guard. Yes, so I I had like a hundred models on the table or something silly, and uh, the, the secret mission I had it was to get my Inquisitor to the highest point on the board, which <laughs> happened to be like eleven inches high, and had your snipers, Space Marine snipers, sat at the top yep. of it. And it's like the rest of the game. I was like, I don't care. I've got to literally run my inquis- and my inquisitor was on the other side of the board with no transport. So he spent the entire game running Jogging. across the board, and then proceeding to charge your snipers on the top of that just to try and get up there. <laughs> it's like th- there was another game going on. But that's the whole. That's the whole. <laughs> uh, the whole thing I love about mm-hmm. Silent War, though, is that. It doesn't really matter what the game is going around it. It's really about what that retinue and the other retinue are doing and trying to work mm-hmm. out what card yeah. is he pulled, what's he trying yeah. to do. The rest, <laughs> of the, army, the rest of the army is like scene dressing to what's going on with the Inquisitors. That is the cool thing about it. But sometimes it would be nice to have just like a spaceship because I'm sure that happens. Failing that, I suspect the the compromise. And part of the problem that I've had with Silent Wars, especially under Ninth Edition, is it, it takes too long. You don't get more than two or three turns in. Mm-hmm. You could almost do day one is the mini games, and that's your, your your boarding action. And day two is the bigger battles, and you play just two games, fifteen hundred points plus your retinue. Mm-hmm. And well, if, uh, if you're going with five hundred points of retinue for mm-hmm. the smaller games. If you've only got a thousand points of the rest of your force at that point, which you can also limit down to the thousand point rule set, where it's like what rule of two, so you're not True. having three big of the same big tank anyway, and just having that thousand points makes it that bit smaller. It also and means less models for Murray to have to paint because you, you know, know it's going to take him so through. long. I'm just going to do a new army anyway. I was like, "Oh, you said what? I'll do a new army. It'll be exact. It'll be the same Space Marine chapter, just all new models." They'll release some new models for you just for that occasion. They've got the new ones with the Nerf guns coming out. Oh fuck! I'm not getting those. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and the new Redemptor with claws. I mean, oh, no, you must have claws. Claw. Yeah, you're going to have to have yeah, one of those. Yeah, uh, you have yeah. two of those, surely. Oh, and I'm I, so- I really want to do. I've got an Archaeopter. The app, the Mechanicus, like flappy flying thing, and I've got it like sat in my pile of shame, ready for a silent war. I'm like, that is, that's going to happen. People from the Mechanicus are going to jump out from that. It's going to be cool. <laughs> I, 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 I to make it took cool. one of those as my transport for my Inquisitor because they are just such cool models. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. but models. but instead they got the little flying taxi of an Arbus that sat in the background. You see, Which, I think the archi- I think if you if you can go if you can travel any way in the forty first millennium, the Archaeopter is the coolest yes. flying machine that we've yet seen. I would agree. I'm so annoyed that they haven't done it for um, uh, what's it called? Oh, Aeronautica. Horus Heresy. Oh, 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 no, 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 for for, for Aeronautica because I'd be I'd be all over Archaeopters for Aeronautica. It'd be so cool. I would love them to do because I mean I, I want the Chaos Hellblades and stuff for Aeronautica because Double Eagle is one of my favourite forty k novels. Um, so I would oh, love them to do a right. set um, Chaos versus Mechanicum. You could have the Archaeopters and stuff for the Mechanicum, and then you could have the uh, Hellblades and Hell Talons and stuff for the Chaos Forces. Okay, random question because 
you lot might know. Is new aeronautica a different scale from old aeronautica? No, no. it's the same Excellent. scale. Excellent. I've got some Eldar sat in a box of Pile of Shame that needs painting because I played, I think, one game against Murray with old aeronautica where it, found, it turns out that like Eldar bombers are as agile as everyone else's fighters and can just yep. get behind them and shoot them. Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. played a couple of games of new aeronautica and I love it. It's really kind of fun really and intuitive good. and it's, it's not too long a game as well, like half an hour I found. Yeah, it's a good game. You can play multiple sessions in an evening, definitely. And you get to play with tiny planes and fly around tiny the room. Planes. Yeah. Oh, I've yeah. got too many tiny, tiny insert vehicle here games I'm playing at the moment. So you've got Yankee, got the uh, Star Wars Armada, got the Stopian Wars. It's got too many. I can't do it anymore. Mm. Well, you know me in tiny miniatures. I'm, I'm already eyeing up epic stuff. I. I in, in between months, I had a long chat with Mike about 3D printing because I desperately want 3D printed Tyranids uh, just so I can do 3D printed Epic. Being able to paint some of the classic Epic Tyranid models, which go for ridiculous money now. I mean, I'd happily buy them if Games Workshop just started re-releasing them, but failing that, picking up some 3D printed ones from him would be awesome. Would you Would you paint them in the original extremely garish and strange scheme, or would yep. you paint to look cool no, no, no. <laughs> i would okay bear in mind that my tyrannid army which is in the cabinet down here i copied the the paint scheme from a guy called garfi i don't know if you followed tale of painters on mm, that website. Yeah, yeah. he's got some amazing tutorials uh but so his tyrannid army is beautiful and he themed it right, trying to do it in the style of the artwork from the second ed tyrannid codex so red skin yeah bone plates um dark kind of purpley colours on the command models and stuff. But, but I remember there being a lot of weird, colors. I remember there being a lot of weird lime green in those yep. armies. Yep. I'm literally going to fly you over a picture now because I have my Tyranid army is basically lime green guns on red models with bone plates and purple. And I would love to paint a second edition and uh, paint a epic Tyranid army in that colour scheme. The I would only be a very one happy man. There's a couple of models in that era that are really iconic and really cool, and they are. I really love that era of Zoanthrope mm. with the huge I head. Like the I like the new ones, but the, that era of Zoanthrope is really cool. And there was a really cool bit of artwork of those Zoanthropes. So I really like those Zoanthropes, and I also really like the Lictor. Oh, guys, the, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. Those guys, yeah. The air. yeah. I really like the Lictor from that period as well. There's like a classic Lictor model. All the screaming killers. Good yeah. old. I really like those high tyrants. The, the the new one the new ones are much more anatom anatomically like plausible. But Viable. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I think it's just I, I like the tyrants in second edge, so you know, if I had to pick a hive tyrant, the re the one I like the most is actually probably the third edition one with the weird smiley head. I like that one a lot. I uh, see the one I like the most is the um, uh, what was it the one with all the, the all the bone swords? What's he called? Uh, Swablord. Oh, the Swablord. Swablord. Yeah. So uh, he's my favourite because he constantly gets dicked over by Space Marine captains. Yeah. It's I, do good wonder, to see. I do wonder. I do. I do think it's possible that the, that the Tyranid hive tyrant might be. The individual model that has had the most re-releases, okay, because it's been it's been re-released as as an individual model at least I think six times. Original second ed metal one was the first one, right? The the mono yeah, yeah. bone sword venom cannon. Then there was the That's third right. ed one with the with the tyranny alien queen head. Yeah. Do you, do you want then to then count the Ford two Ford World, World versions of that? I was yeah. going to say, do they count Willard? Ford World <laughs> Okay. Yes, they count. Yeah, yeah. So two forger versions puts us on four. Then the plastic kit that we have now. Oh no, no, then metal. No, 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 no. The metal version There's of the kit that we have one. now. There was a metal There's one in the style of what there. we have now. That is fine. Yeah. Which is very similar to the style of the plastic kit we have now, but it came in metal, and then there's the plastic one we have now. So six versions? Yeah, I think it's been re released six times, and I think I don't think there is I don't think there's another model that has been re released that many times and not like had its name changed or whatever. Huh. 
There's been quite a few versions of the Bloodthirster. I've, I've, I've got to say, Space Marine Captain. Yeah, okay, you're not talking <laughs> generics, though, I suppose. No, 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 the, the, the thing about it, the thing about Space Marine Captain is I don't even think, I think if you think about, like, models that have been released as, like, this is a Space Marine Captain, I don't actually think there's that many. Okay, I mean, there's the, okay, no, if no, we look no, at no. generations of models... There's the captain they released back in Rogue Trader. There's the cap metal captains they released at the beginning of second edition. There's the metal captain they released with the big sword sticking up like that for third edition. Uh, and and these are just generics still. There's the mm. plastic multi-pose captain that they released where you could have every weapon option in a box. Yeah. So is he released as a captain? That's yeah, general. he was released as Space Marine Captain. That, that was Space Marine Captain Kit. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Then there's um, terminate. There's multiple Terminator Captain. There's been Terminator Captain at least a couple of times. Is a limited there edition Games Termin- Day Captain. Yeah, Metal Terminator Captain, Games Day Captain, Plastic I'm Terminator Captain. Um, pretty sure there was a, a plastic Captain with an eagle mask. That yeah, was part, uh, of a that was command. part of the Command Squad. Yeah, um, so. that was the one we got with the librarian and the chaplain, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, like, yeah. Oh, uh, and then there was all the uh, all the special captains in um, Armageddon, along with the Thunderhammer one. Oh jump, yeah, all the- and no, no, no. See, see, those are releases. Think the thing is that what I'd say is like there are lots of models that release as like Space Marine Commander or Space Marine like Primaris Captain or Terminator yeah. Captain. Those and are those captains. Don't though. Count. They, yeah, they Why don't, don't they count? count? Why don't they count? Because the Hive Tyrant is just released as Hive Tyrant. It's been, re- it's been redone. I don't think anything else has been re-sculpted as many times as an individual. So, yeah, if, 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 you're ta- if you're taking, as opposed to essentially weapon swaps, which is what the Space Marine Captain mostly was. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of what the Forge World ones were as well, though, was to give them, like, wings or to give him, like, different weapon options. So I don't think you can count the Forge World ones at that point. You're on mute, mate. Uh, Willard, you are muted again. It's been re-released a lot of times. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that, yes. I would agree with you on that. I mean, on, the on, the opposite end, on the opposite end, the things that haven't been released many, many times, are we still using the original Warp Spiders? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, they yeah. must be 30 years old. More, oh, maybe even. you say that. The Space Marine bikes are still the second day bikes. <laughs> yes. Mm. Are they really? Yes, yeah. they are. And it, they are a it, bastard to put together. Here's, here's the one I found recently. Poison Wind Glob it is. Oh, you can still order yeah. in metal from Games Workshop. Yep. <laughs> and and which, they're going for eBay. Like People are buying them on eBay for more than they cost direct <laughs> from Games Workshop. Because they're older. Clearly, they're better because they're older. Don't try and add logic to this. Yeah, just, just, just for anybody watching who wants them, just buy them from Game. Like, don't pay over the odds on eBay. But that's how they win. That's how it was going to get Workshop get you. I suppose <laughs> by making it new. <laughs> yes. <laughs> by making oh, it. Are you fair? I don't know if they've made it new. It may just be that they've still just got a giant box of play, you know, poison wing. No, I like they to think they've got that one them. centrifugal machine going in the in the corner that is just the poison wing. Going. <laughs> I love the idea they, they do they do the made to order runs, and it's like, oh, we've we've done all the made to order run of this. What should we do now? More globadiers? Okay, more globadiers. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of anything else that's really so. old. I'm trying to think of anything else that's like really, really, really old. Uh, Elder Range worked for a very long time. Yeah, yeah Plastic Caster Chance must be up there. Although yeah. Every single Phoenix Lord, apart from James R. And Morgan yeah. Ruff. Oh, and Morgan Ruff. Sorry. Okay. The Re- worst one yeah. and the best one. Until recently, you could still get Baroth, which I showed earlier, in metal from Games Workshop. Well, they have the Infine cast in. Uh, Thank I d- God, I don't- no. <laughs> I, I, I really yeah. hope not for anybody who wants to buy him. So it fails. You know what? I don't. You know what? This is a really controversial games workshop opinion, but I actually think Fine Cast no. was completely fine. Like I never had any problems with it, and it was way easier to work with than metal. I have swooping hawks that are just kind of curled up like this. Like literally, no matter. I, I've, I've soaked them in boiling water and straightened them a couple of times, and then next time I get them out of the case, they're just kind of hunching in on themselves because they do not want to be 
miniature shape. They want to return to their resin ball form. Yeah, like, I accept like, that there are some models that do not work in point and cast, but I never had a problem with it. Yeah, I think it, it, the quality control at the start of the whole fine cast thing was not there. So there was <laughs> a <polite>. lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, had a, I had a model that had air bubbles in it. Literal air bubbles. It was like, what's going on with this one? <laughs> it, it's, it's where people were like, the, the model was missing a face because it mm -hmm. was just one big air bubble. It's like, hmm, really? But Games Workshop customer service has always been pretty good about fixing that. So I've got mm. to give them credit there. Nowadays, I'm not sure whether they've actually changed the fine cast resin, but modern, what few things they do in fine cast seems to be, touch wood, pretty good. At least from what I've had. I do have a fine cast Valkyrie who has had both her spear and wings replaced with spare ones I've had in the Scourge kit, because they're plastic, because they actually like... Don't Curl a little ball and cry. Yeah, and, and also <laughs> why, try, why just... trying to pin find cast. It's yeah, which which when the join for the spear is her wrist. It was like really, yeah. So mind you, at least the sense. drill goes into the fine cast. Okay, I remember um, it was a metal skink wizard or something, that one that had the the stick like that and the the, the staff on the wrist was a separate piece and would break off every single time we took the one out of the Games Workshop Reading um, sort of store miniature case. So Andy Hatton tasked me with pinning the wrist on the skink. And it's like, the drill bit is maybe a micron smaller on each side than wow. the, the, the hand I'm trying to drill. That is rough. I would not pin a skink wrist. That is no. like... I'm trying to think of the most difficult... I'm trying to think about the most difficult model I've ever built for games. I think the Screaming Skull, the uh, the the early 2000s Screaming Skull catapult was that was out there. That the was Tomb like, Kings one, the Tomb Kings one was really really hard to build. That was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to build. Crew tops, crew tops, and, yeah. and the reason the reason that I've heard people say why it's so bad was there was originally two different crew tox models with different parts for each on different molds and one of the molds broke so oh whether it's true or not the two halves for a crutox are not meant to go together <laughs> i should not be oh, i mean there's a similar um, story about a dwarf command model that they produced at the yeah. end towards the end of eighth edition fantasy there was a plastic i've seen them in the wild plastic sprue that they did mm. of a dwarf lord, dwarf lord multi yeah. kit complete with shield bearers and everything and then they dropped the mold and they went oh sod it oh, oh yeah end times is happening anyway it's not going to matter and that's why we never got that really nice the, the thing is though that mold i knew that that mold existed like during I mean, it was it's much older than you think mm. so it that mold it's interesting right okay interesting bit of games workshop conspiracy theory in four hats time so there are a lot of things that are cast up that, that they have not yet released for all sorts of reasons. Um, so, for example, I noticed on my Chaos Sorcerer for the Tale of Four Gamers um, thing, she has a, the copyright date on the sprue is 2019. And I was okay. like, oh, that has sat around for a long time. And I think that to an extent, I think some of the Warhammer Plus models are like, this is really cool, but we haven't got a release window for it. Let's just put it out on Warhammer Plus. And I also think um, that Dwarf Lord Sprue, I definitely knew it existed in like the early 2000s when I was a staff member. Like that was that was like really, really, it was done at the same time as the Skull Pass Dwarves, I think. And it's done in mm. the same style as the Skull Pass Dwarves. And I, I, I think the story of the mold being dropped is possibly true. Um but I, de I definitely, I, there were hundreds made. It wasn't like a few. No, like I said, I've, I've seen him in the wild. I've seen someone who's yeah. physically got one because I tried to get him to part with it and he wouldn't, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they definitely like, definitely pretty much anyone who wanted one at head office could have one at the time. Mm. Um, and I, that's definitely one of those ones where there was, I went for a job interview for the, to be editor of White Dwarf at one point. And you could have been the new fat bloke. I could have been. I would. I. I had the build. Um, but yeah, it was. It was basically. It was really weird. It was basically like 
there was an interview panel, and it was me, Shay Webster, who was obviously in White Dwarf all the time, Space McQuirk, who was also, like, in White Dwarf all the time, and, like, you know, background writer or whatever. And then there was, like, mm-hmm. one other guy. And for whatever reason, I don't think any of us got it. I don't think any of us got it. Maybe it was... And, 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 and we were all obviously shit. We obviously didn't... Couldn't do <laughs> Um, but we all went for that. We all went for the job and, um, yeah, but they had like a box basically in the interview. Like one of the interview things you had to do was they gave you a box of miniatures and you just had to build like a cool conversion as part of the job, just the job interview. They were like, build a cool conversion out of this box of models. Um, but yeah, there were definitely, I think there were like dwarf Lord sprues in the box and it was just like a like a box of like wacky sprues, just stuff that they had lying around the office at the time. Something like that, yeah. Would have been would have been two thousand six. Okay, so Definitely. I'm just reflecting on the fact here that you you're doing the role of the army that Paul Sawyer did in the original Tale of Four Gamers, and you very nearly became the next Paul Sawyer. I wouldn't say I, ever, I, I interviewed to be Paul Sawyer, but I did not. I did not get the job to be Paul Sawyer. But I could have. It could have been. You could, could have, been. have been. What the path not taken? That's... I know. I know. If only somebody had. Uh, if, if only somebody had made a bad decision about hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, then you wouldn't. We wouldn't have this awesome podcast that you've got out there now. Yeah, I mean, my life the wo- and the world would be very different. Would be a very different place if I had run White Dwarf for fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> what startling fact you could reveal? I've got an incredible hobby anecdote to share with you all, which isn't Ooh. fantasy related, but it is a good ane- a good hobby anecdote. Go for so, it. Hate the brilliant games club of which I've been a member of for now for ten years, and on the executive committee of for like eight. Um, we ordered a load of boarding action action terrain to do a boarding action campaign and the courier with the enormous amount of boarding action terrain we organised to do like 10 tables worth of boarding actions lost all the boarding action terrain and so we were like oh my god there's like literally hundreds of pounds worth of boarding action terrain going missing and then totally appropriately for the narrative of the campaign, it emerged sport unexpectedly today. I was like, oh my god, it's perfect Ludo narrative synchronization. Like where yeah, our space hold <laughs> for some time and then just appeared. Like literally, I've got to the point where the, the packaging company are like, it is gone, it's never returning. It cannot be found. There is no chance of returning. Please file the insurance claim on our website. And then it just turned up today. And I was like, ah, I'm very, very particularly pleased because, like, I now have a space up instead of an insurance claim. But it was pretty cool. I was very happy to see it. Boarding action is a fucking brilliant way to play 40k. I'm looking forward to trying it. It is. I've had a couple of games now. I've got another game tomorrow. Mm. Um, it is just probably hands down the best way of playing forty k. Yeah. Um, I'm obviously I'm obviously duty bound to do this, particularly if it's on the stream. But if you want to try boarding action, <laughs> today in East London, we've got loads of terrain currently in a box waiting to be painted. <laughs> Have you actually built it yet? No, it arrived at like five o'clock. Okay, just <laughs> just to let you know. So I was I. I because I've got a load of the kill team into the dark stuff, which is exactly the same kit. Um, so I had three of those. Um, and I started just getting one out of the sprues, and it took four hours to get like, it out of the sprue for one like one half of boarding action. Um, and I was like, right, fine. And I was going up to Nottingham to see Andy, and we're like, right, well, I still want to play the uh, kill team. And... Um, I kept it. Um, and he was like, John, do you want to play boarding action instead? And this was like Thursday night. I was going for Friday. I was like, I don't think I can get the rest of it done. And it's, oh, that's a shame. It's a really good way of playing it. And then turned the, the went sort of like, it was like um, nine o'clock at night. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. And so I was up to one o'clock scraping mold lines mm. on this terrain. I was like, I finished it, Andy. We can play. <laughs> Are the mold lines <laughs> on it? Or is oh, it? Just, so, contrary to what the internet will have you believe, they're not as bad as everybody internet keeps a rabbiting on about. They are 
perfectly fine. It's just scraping them off so when you come to paint them, it doesn't look like it's a fucking huge mold line going down the center of it. The ones that are on like the, the joints are you just yeah, it's usual tidying up as you would do any model. Um, and they go some are some are a bit stiff, um, occasionally. And the toppers that you put on just have a flathead screwdriver around just to get some of them off. So some of them are fine, they come off quite easily. Uh, some okay. of them are a little bit st stick, so just and it, they come off fine. This is, once you, this is helpful context. I say once you put it together, um you've played like five or six games, it, they're gonna get looser anyway from putting them in and out because you have to change the way that all the layouts are. So it's they're gonna wear down. So it, it's not it yeah. Like the internet would love to, you know, have you believe that it's a terrible design and a ter and that they should be hung, drawn and quartered for making such a terribly molded thing. It's not. It's fine. Okay, let me put the clickbait title up there. You know, spoiler alert, you won't believe what terrible decision games workshops made this time. Oh, yeah. Please, yeah. please give me twenty thousand views in the first second. For saying like, that. Like, you know, has everyone seen that GW has announced a price rise? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's an annual. I don't understand how people are amazed that there is an annual price rise. Like, have, I've never thought a business I'm, would do business at me. It, it, oh it no, there's a price say. rise that's in line with inflation. It's lower it's than inflation. One of those things where I'm, I'm a bit like, so on one hand, I can't believe people are looking at their bills and going, my energy bill is up 150%. <laughs> my but I can't avoid a four toy soldiers. My, yet yeah, my toy soldier <laughs> bill is up 6%. Like, mm, it's very, for a company that one of the main costs that they'll be running for producing these models is energy because they've got yeah. to melt all that plastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do have some, I do obviously have some sympathy with the fact that it's a very expensive hobby yeah. and it's getting more expensive and particularly some of the price rises in like bad countries like America are really, really out there. Like, you know, the plastic jet bikes, I think, have gone up to, like... They've gone up to comparable with how much they were from Forge World. They've gone up from, like, effectively, like, 35 quid. Is, is, quid is, is, is that the first price for us list that they released, or the second? The because, second one. Okay, because the first one they released was just wrong. <laughs> it's like, some things were going up, like, 50%. Yeah, like, I don't... It doesn't seem right. No, it wasn't right. Somebody screwed up. Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? Like, cause there's clearly like a lot of like, it's quite, clearly there's a lot of production trouble going on in general terms. Like, I mean, I would love nice cat, Murray. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent um, cat. I would love to know the like hidden history. Here's a here's a video that will do like a billion views. I'd love to know what really happened with Curse City. Okay. Yeah. I've Sh short of cat like kidnapping somebody from the design studio and waterboarding them, we are not going to get the true story on. I that. think Peachy, yeah, has now left, the, and he did the, a the paint there, phase. There, they've got one. There, there was a discussion apparently. Like I haven't seen it myself, but somebody's <laughs> said that on it, Peachy and whoever he was with mm. briefly mentioned Curse City, and I. The problem that, that they mentioned was the fact that box was marked as made in UK, but the printed products were from China. So right. it gets into a whole legal, like, mis-selling country of origin. Oh, my God. Which is a, a, a huge thing, like, from a business legal point of view. Nothing from a gaming point of view. No. But you can completely understand why, if it's said made in the uk and they're printing everything in china they can't do that and it's so that they may have got the first run out but then they have to re reprint all yeah. the boxes that say made in the uk in china do yeah. it and, and, and... i get the impression there was like a whole release strategy as well though like where a lot of those models that came out as part of like the, mm -hmm. the empire race the soul -like were stuff I mean, technically, we we can refer to them as soul like grave lords, but ultimately, this is a this is a fifth and sixth edition channel. Yes. <laughs> Undead. <laughs> Undead. <laughs> no, no, no. Undead. Or Bretonians, yeah. if you want to talk about flesh lords. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I, sort of, I, um, I, I, kind I know, of like, I know what looks yeah. at Ben. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I know what will upset Ben. Many this things will upset Ben. <laughs> Look at my Bretonians. 
No, no, that's fine. That's clearly just from Movie Sword, is all. He's, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's just from the cursed city of Movie Sword, the real, the original cursed city. He's been. Um, Look he's at my seen... Lady of the Lake. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not an elf. <laughs> my, ah, my, my, so my <laughs> Uh, sorry, sorry for that derailing. It's, it's quite all right. It's fine. I, um, I think the thing with Curse City that was part of the big problem was that it wasn't just that they had issues with its release, but it was the way their communications ran. This product will. Don't worry if you don't get it in the initial run. It will guaranteed one hundred percent. You can like break both my legs if I'm lying. Be That's around it. forever. You can always get a copy of this. Yeah, it goes out of much, out, yeah. goes out of stock within the first two minutes. I, oh, I, sorry, this is never going to be available again, and you can't ask us why, and we're not going to tell you. And we're now just going to sit with our hands over our head, not saying anything for the next year, and then suddenly re-release it and pretend everything's okay. And you know, they could Rinse have communicated repeat. slightly better. Yeah, I, I, for them as a company to do that, I, it, like, there had to be lawyers involved somewhere. Like, <laughs> I, I, like <laughs> you're just blaming my profession. I, you can't. I can't imagine the company would have because they must have known that PR was an absolute disaster. But going complete radio <laughs> silence on it, like. <laughs> if they had put a stack of boxes in the car park at Lenton and then just filmed themselves setting them on fire, <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't have handled it worse. Yeah. <gasps> it's, it's one of those things where I don't know if you guys read the. Um, so, Aaron, I can't remember his name now, but a guy at Hate called Aaron mm. who writes for Goonhammer wrote a brilliant long read about Gorkamorka and how yes. Gorkamorka was kind of like this sort of fundamental inflection point between like a sliding doors moment between like completely had that had gorka morka um been different like gw would be a completely different company and it sort of like hugely sort of set the tone for the gw to come so for example like one of the reasons why gw is such an unusual company is it doesn't take on any debt like it doesn't borrow money yeah. it just uses cash right which is incredibly unusual Unlike um, his yes indeed who um I thought was, uh, that's another interesting GW story. There, there was a brief period where GW was involved with like um, a kind of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Klarna, which is a sort of like... Bino Pele. Yeah, Bino Pele. Yeah. Um, and, and it was briefly, it was integrated in the GW website that isn't integrated anymore. And I was like, hmm, thereby hangs... My journalist instinct went, hmm, thereby hangs a tail, you know. I'd be... Interested, and it could be just part of Klarna's like general kind of retreat from the British High Street, but like it was still quite amusing. That was like because I definitely, I definitely, when I worked at Games Workshop, there was definitely a guy who was evicted and living in his car and still coming in to buy models. And I was like, I remember having like, I remember having a discussion with my manager where I was like, can I refuse him service and be like, stage an intervention? Yeah, I was like, literally like, Leon, you need to get a flat, stop buying Cadians. <laughs> like, you know. I mean, I did, that, I did that when I was working there. There was a guy who kept on. Well, you lived like, in your car? <laughs> no, no, no. He was on. He was on benefits, um, and he went. He would literally. He'd, I'd see him walk to the job centre because it was opposite where GW was, just down the road, and then come back with the money he'd got from the job centre and spend. Try to spend half of it on models. It's like. No, that's for you to live. <laughs> so there's a part of me that feels that that is like, obviously I would say this because I'm exactly the sort of person that believes in this sort of thing, but the, the part of me feels that is quite paternalistic and you're like, well, you know, it's his money and he can spend it how it likes. And ultimately, if he's spending it on, you know, if he's spending it on models and he's going home and he's got nothing else to do all day, maybe he just wants to like paint some nights. Like, oh, that's I, didn't know, I knew he had the fucking loads of stuff. <laughs> so like, he, had, he had a pile of shame he could he paint. Has, I was like, you sir have a pile of shame and that is for you to live and to find an actual job so no stop it I'm not, I'm not yeah. telling you anything anymore yeah no, I, just, I, I fortunately I decided to let the invisible hand of the market solve things so I, just, I kept selling <laughs> I kept selling to that guy it's like uh, it's his choice fine <laughs> Speaking of your journalistic instincts, how is the podcast ranking? It is the number one in the world. You made it to number one. Number one in the world, yeah. So we're, we're, we, we, it was much easier to get the story to number one in the US 
than it was to get it to number one in the UK. So we only achieved number one in the UK, I think, today, but we were number one in the US from Thursday. Congratulations! But, but, That's very good. Congrats. What have, what have I completely missed? Do you want to give it a plug? Oh, absolutely. The the so, so it would be better the other way round if I could plug this yeah. podcast. That, like, I would appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, okay. I'll see what I can do. Um, I think Wondery might say no, but we'll... <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell Mike and Murray about your podcast, though? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so I did. I've, I've recently I've released a podcast called Stolen Hearts, and it's all about a just perfect time for Valentine's Day. It's all. It's a story about a decorated Welsh policewoman who falls in love with a wonderful man. She meets a man online. She's been unlucky in love. Meets this wonderful man online. He's a hair care entrepreneur. Uh, and he has a gangster-themed line of hair care products with names like the body wash is called Beat the Filth, and the uh, the the hair gel is called Stick 'Em Up. Right, like it's all it's all very Guy Ritchie era kind of gangster pun. But anyway, he's a great guy. He takes her out, treats her nice, like a family like him. It's all going brilliantly. And then one night she gets a phone call, and this slightly this is a slight spoiler here. You will not be surprised to learn it in a podcast about, you know, about romance. Things do not run smoothly, but she gets a phone call one night and he's been arrested and he's been arrested because he's been robbing banks. <laughs> it turns out he's in fact not a hair care entrepreneur. He's in fact Britain's most successful bank robber and has been dating a copper the whole time. And like his own crew have been like, you're dating a what? <laughs> you know, like, so it's, it's the, the way that all sort of pans out between like... His crew finding out he's dating a cop, her colleagues finding out she's dating Britain's bank robber, and of course the police assuming that the reason he's such a successful bank robber is she's been like the inside woman, effectively. Um, but yeah, it's a true love. It's a, it's a, people frequently have said to me like, why on earth? Why on earth did the characters do X? Why did they do Y? Like, why did they do what they did? And I'm like, because it was true love. <laughs> That's the because answer. people are stupid. No, it was love. It's I know. Love. It, it's just one of those <laughs> from, from from the like from outside. Like you can see, like this is a stupid idea. But when you're in it, like yeah. And um, for it's such a small story about kind of you know rural cops and bank robbers, but there you go. But yes, so world number one podcast. It was it's very good. It people people seem to like it. No, okay. congratulations! I'm going to have to yeah, give it a listen. I, I haven't. I, I, I went and voted for it. I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm going to have to give it a listen. Yeah. So somebody. Yeah, I think I think as somebody who works in the British justice system, I think you may you may have some questions about the inter, the the investigative. Is it content. inaccurate by any chance? No, it's totally accurate but the problem with it is i think you may have some questions about the investigative competence of several people involved <laughs> oh, am i gonna be shouting at the screen i think well i think you might be in a situation you're where you're like what do you mean you did that with the evidence <laughs> it's evidence <laughs> like you know yeah the, yeah the evidence evidence handling and witness tampering are like you know, the police did not come out particularly certainly with my sort of former barrister hat on I was like yeah the, the just errors have been made <laughs> by various people in this podcast <laughs> oh. um, we should probably talk a little bit more about four gamers because that is the yeah. title of the video um, mm. I know what I'm doing for next month then because I'm hopeful I will have these nights errant done probably by the end of the week maybe um, oh, but cer certainly um, in time for, for March so my, I've got part of my month three set up here behind me. I have successfully managed to trace and source the original four questing knights from the questing knights box. So I've got four of these little lads set up here behind me, stripped, prime, well, stripped up prime. They're stripped, built, and ready to go. Uh, I've got the Grail Knights. Again, it's the same three models uh, that were in the Grail Knight box set that they did. And then, very kindly, Mike, from his pile of shame, has sent to me the Bretonian Duke on Pegasus. Oh, that's a cool one. Very, 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 very cool one. I'm really looking forward to painting that. 
So I'm going to be painting lots and lots and lots of extremely pretty and very complicated knights in March. With the most going from really simple heraldry on the knights errand because they don't have to faff around with like you know heraldic symbols and stuff. It's just geometric shapes in fifth edition Bretonians for the knights errand. I'm going to be going to the incredibly detailed Grail knight heraldry on these three, and also the the Duke on Grail, uh, or he's going to be I think a Grail knight hero on Pegasus. To, to fly around the place and, and smite the nastiest monsters or war machines that you guys decide to take. So that's going to be my buy, uh, three for um, for two months. Buy two boxes, get the third for free, uh, whatever store opening. I might take myself down to Games Workshop Reading and just pretend that I'm buying them there. <laughs> um, if we go around, Mike, what is month three looking like for you? Uh, I, I am also going to go for the buy two, get one free. So uh, with that, I decide what's better than one warp fire thrower, three warp three. fire throwers, and also what's better than one Jezel, three Jezels. <laughs> I'm so sorry, boys. You're going to get absolutely immolated. <laughs> I, My trees. I, I've got this template. Yeah. Is this the right size? Yeah. yeah. It is. Very big. No, it is. They they shrank it for sixth edition. For sixth edition, I think it, it got a much smaller flavor template. Because, that's the right temp. Yeah, I know. That's that's a lot of because I was looking at it like you can't move and shoot them. It's like okay, fine. And then I saw that, and I'm like, and that goes in artillery dice forward before yeah. it. Like, yeah, can that you just stick them behind? Like, they just they could just trudge behind Skaven slaves and go. <laughs> oh, I've caught some of them. Ah, oh, well. It's 11... I've, I've got a tape measure handy. It's 11 inches long. It is exactly the same size as a unit of the lance formation of my knights, upsettingly. <laughs> oh, because I know. <laughs> as if by design. If it lands on target, they all end up on fire. It's just like, if, if you move forward, I can hit you from my deployment zone. Yeah. I don't need to move. I will be praying to the lady and hoping that you can't roll a four up to, sh to be allowed to shoot it. That's why I've got That's three. I've got three. <laughs> the problem is you having three of them. Okay. So I know one, one of them's going to get those grail knights. So the hero on Pegasus will be swooping down to kill then. Um, okay, so you're going to set us all on fire <laughs> with flamethrowers, and, and those who aren't on fire will then be picked off by sniper rounds. That's for the Pegasus. <laughs> Fly high, turn one. Swoop down, turn two. <laughs> I'll, I'll think of something. It's always great when everyone else is playing some kind of Renaissance era <laughs> army, and Skaven are clearly somewhat, somewhere towards the end of World War One. Poison gas, flame fire. Yes. <laughs> um, Willard, what are you painting for month three when you've no. got month two's giant done? <laughs> Once again, once again, I'm reliving the experience of being a teenager because I don't know what I'm painting. Because basically what I've done is I've given my wife a list of models, right, that I would like, <laughs> all, of which are, all of which are rare and strange things like the Nick Bibby War Wither. That would be a cool thing to paint. So I've given my wife a list of, like, weird 80 monsters of various types. And I'm hoping that at some point in the middle, because my wife is like an enormously successful corporate lawyer, so I'm hoping at some point in the middle of phone <laughs> call, a guy called Chad, uh, 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 she's like scouring me pay for weird <laughs> monsters. So I don't know what it's going to be, but it will probably be weird monsters for my wizard to turn into. <laughs> I think at some point I should get your wife on one of these videos just to interview her on what is it like trying to track down weird 80s monsters for your husband when you know nothing about the hobby <laughs> something just an aside about old monsters I was trying to track down this guy is that a death chicken oh that's right it's a griffin oh griffin it's a griffin, griffin. Okay. so I was trying to track it down because he's been like I got him in the nineties um, and I had no idea where he came from. I bought him painted when I was little. Um, so I was trying to work out what it was. And it's actually a Ral Partha model, not a Citadel one. Okay. But in investigating that Ral Partha was, and Citadel cross sold each other's products for a year or two in the eighties, because when 
Citadel were trying to push into uh, the US, where Roll Partha was established, they formed a business alliance. So therefore, Citadel released, under their own codes, some of the Roll Path models. Okay. Roll Path has been picked up fairly recently, and or recently, in the last 20 years. Um, and you can still, like, I can go online and buy that guy from Roll Partha um, for about a tenner. Oh my god, okay. So, I will try and dig out the list of Citadel Ral Partha monsters in case any of those, because I think the Jabberwock is one of them, but I could be wrong. No, the Jabberwock um, is definitely one of them. I'm 99% sure. So, yeah. So, in, in, ca in case it makes it easier to track down some of these very old monsters when you can buy them new. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've sent a whole new round of browsing at some point in my near future, <laughs> looking through newly made ancient models. Going, oh, look at that! Mm. And what about you, Murray? What are you what are you cooking up? Oh, right. So, if I finish um, month one, <laughs> <laughs> and then if I finish month two, which is just an extra five glade riders, month three is also taking uh, advantage of the three for do. And buying a uh, mage on Warhawk, and then five Warhawk riders. That's four. <laughs> they, they are very cool. Mm, very cool. So that would be so. That's that'd be thirty quid usually. Mm -hmm. with three for two at a, um, and then. Somehow, I don't know how I did the maths. Oh, yes, because I moved some m money over from the month afterwards, uh, previous. Um, getting three blisters of uh, War Dancers and three blisters of Way Watchers. I like the way you're doing like a hand gesture yeah, to show <laughs> War Dancers. Way Watchers! Way Watchers do jazz hands. <laughs> they do like that. It's like this and like this. Some of them are like this. Um, are you going to do... Are you going to do the classic Mike McVeigh war dancers with stripy trousers and tattoos? I mean, I'm, I'm yes, of course I am going to. Like, it's a complicated paint scheme. Of course it's going to be doing it. I can't not do it because I, I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, oh, I could do this easily. No, I remember I'm going to paint woad on them now. Have you, have you ever read that Mike McVeigh article about how he painted? It's one of the first things where they had a whole army and they explained how he painted it. Have you ever read that article about how he paints the stripy not. trousers? It's wild. And there's a conversion in there where he's basically like, he's got like a war dancer lord on a, a hawk and it's beautifully painted. But the convert, there was a conversion article and literally the article in, it's like 90, like early 90s White Dwarf and nice. the conversion of the war hawk, like four pages of diagrams if you want to do it. And you're just like, I remember you, reading it as a child and I was like, you dig it out. I don't own a door. How am I supposed to do this? <laughs> like, I will dive into the back catalogs and see if I can find that issue for you, Murray. Because oh, clearly you'll want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I won't want to, but I'll end up doing it anyway. <laughs> Murray, can, can, can I offer you some advice from somebody who, who paints very quickly? Mm. If you're going to cover most of a war dancer, in blue war paint, don't do six levels of highlighting on the skin first. But if you gullum and flesh like... it, spray white, gullum and flesh it, and then spend your time detailing on the, the, the tattoos. But you'll always know that that's what you did to the skin tone. Yeah, it is true. Whereas, you know, nine different highlights going up from Cadian flesh all the way up to Pallid Witch flesh. Oh, no. It's white dwarf <laughs> one for one. One for one. Okay, I try to dig out. One for one is in, and it is the article is. I remember reading it as a teenager, and I was like, "This is insane!" And it was the army is still now. The army would still stand up as like a beautiful army. Okay. I shall get some screen grabs of it for you, Murray, and send them over to you, so you've got the diagram of how to paint the stripy trousers. Thank you. Cool. 
Right, well, I'm going to get on with painting these knights errant. Um, I, think I shall see you all soon. Probably a good place for us to, to call it a night, guys. Mm. Thanks I'll very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of Twitter on. And as ever, I will throw up links to stuff we've talked about in the description below. Uh, in the meantime, mm. thanks for watching. Thank you very much.